next and I'm just going to keep going around the back. Hi, my name is Leah Mustang Fred. I'm 17 and in about two and a half hours I will become either a violent criminal or a helpless victim. Or so goes the logic. And um, I'm gonna, I have been a vocal um, anti-corrupt view advocate and while there are, there's a kind of list in the back of my head about what's wrong with this, I'd like to talk about the two core problems in this debate. The first being this violent criminal, helpless victim. They were bringing up that, um, that the, like, you pointed out that two and three, the reasons why we're implementing this, are to keep kids from getting into the trouble, and keep kids out of harm's way. But number one was to keep, to help parents fulfill their roles as parents. But my question is, I know I have parents sitting right here, and a parent sitting right there, and my parents sitting at home, and many other parents who are wondering, why, how are they helping them fulfill their roles if the parents have decided that, yes, my kid has made a good decision, my kid has a real reason to be out till 12.15 or 12.20. Like, why are we forgetting, why are we looking at this violent criminal and helpless victim logic and not questioning where do the parents fit in and where does the Constitution fit in? And the second aspect of our logic, which is really troubling me, is this good kids versus bad kids thing. If you'd like to hear about that more, you can read Officer Carter's editorial in the Post. Of course, it was written in, I mean, I understand that the police have very good intentions for this bill, but um, there are some very worrisome implications of a bill where you're saying that there are good kids and there are bad kids, and that we will know who the bad kids are. This whole selective enforcement concept, um, even with these, uh, we have these exceptions that allow kids to be at entertainment events or school events, I mean, my question is um, an issue of financial discrimination. Like, maybe we are colorblind, maybe we will be picking out the black kids and Hispanic kids, I know at my school and hallway enforcement, everyone's very much aware of the racial profiling that goes on there, which leads me to question it. But um, even if we're not going to have these racial profiling laws, what about financial discrimination? Because the core of the bill that says that you need to be at the movies or at a restaurant to be okay in task art, and if you're the type of kid that doesn't have the money to be going to these things, that you hang out because that's, that's your way of having fun, because you don't have the money to be burning $30 every weekend night, or because you choose to, as I said, hanging out is not a crime. There is something in the First Amendment of our Constitution, and I think very deep in our hearts as Americans, about the whole concept of you should be able to be at when you want if you are a law-abiding citizen. So um, after all of that, what I, my last warning kind of is this placebo effect. So we're saying we're being sold very nicely this lovely concept of our curfew that will solve all of our problems. But um, I've only seen one reputable <coughs> study that showed that curfews worked. Meanwhile, the, um, the PG curfew, the most recent data is from 2000, so it's possible enforcement has changed. But by an Urban Institute study in 2000, they found uh, findings in some way showed that any impact of the law on the target group of youth, ages 12 to 16, was small and not statistically significant. Furthermore, the curfew, the impact of the law on reducing victimizations to all individuals was small and not significant. The hotspots or clusters of victimization during curfew are remain markedly stable. So um, the only small impact they found was that um, victimization on 22 to 25 year olds decreased, but the, um, the author of the study links that to the Chief of Police's Violence Abatement Project, which was implemented a few months before the first year, think that might have been the cause. And uh, furthermore, what, uh, what he found out in, in analyzing this was that um, says perhaps steady and consistent enforcement on, on processing curfews all across police districts would have contributed to a larger reduction of victimization. However, given limited resources, that may have not been an option. So the question is, we're selling this as, as a free reduction of crime, but there are, I mean, I've got a little stack of other things. DC curfew has also been shown not to be effective. If anyone would like to look at the city mayor's thing that they referenced, it's, a, um, it's essentially an opinion survey of the people who implemented the curfew, so not very reliable, but you can look at that. But um, my question is, we're selling this as free, happy way to get out of our problems. But if it hasn't been shown very often to do anything, and the only, all these people are, are concluding that the way to make it do something is to spend more money on it, why aren't we looking at Carter's list of 11 options? Or um, I know there's someone sitting right here who has a whole list of options about what else we could be doing. If we're going to have to spend money, why are we spending it on something which won't necessarily work? Okay. I think we should we evaluate. Thank you. I'm going to note.